Good morning, good afternoon, and very warm welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Katya Popova, and together with Mike Robert, I'm co-director of a large solstice project which has been operating in the Western Indian Ocean for more than four years now, and now coming to an end. So almost half of our project time was under some form of COVID restriction restrictions and that unfortunately prevented us to run in final project meeting together in Western Indian Ocean with all project participants and stakeholders. So to at least partially compensate for this, we're running this webinar series. So welcome to the webinar two, um, which is dedicated to the living marine resources of the Pemba Channel. So without further ado, I will uh, pass microphone to Amani, who is running today's webinar, and we will begin. So very warm welcome to everyone. Hi, everyone. Um, so we're going to start off today with a, an introductory video from our MOOC, which is currently running. Um, so I'll start off with that, and then um, if you would like to join the MOOC, we'll put a um, link in the chat to Future Learn so that you can sign up and do the full course. Just south of the equator off the coast of Tanzania lies the Zanzibar Archipelago, Unguja, also known as Zanzibar, and Pemba. In this series of lectures, our attention will focus on the Zanzibar and Pemba channels, two straits separating the mainland of Tanzania from the islands. You will learn about the coastal communities inhabiting their shores and try to understand how their lives are influenced by the marine environment and how an accelerated pace of climate change is going to impact them. This introductory lecture was written by Dr. Nariman Jadawi, a fisheries expert from the Institute of Marine Sciences in Zanzibar, and Professor Mike Roberts, a physical oceanographer from the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. For centuries, the history, culture and economy of the coastal population living on the shore of the Pemba Channel have been rooted in the sea. Much of the coastal population is reliant on fishing for their livelihoods. Most people live in small villages along the coast, with fishing being the main daily activity. Small pelagic fish, mostly anchovy and sardine, are not only an important component of the diet, but also are sold to buyers and then exported to other African countries. This provides cash to the villagers, who are then able to purchase other needed items. So in other words, people with very little alternative livelihoods other than fishing. Small pelagics are small forage fish that live in the surface and near surface waters over the continental shelf of most of the coasts around the globe and constituting nearly half of the global fish landings. Sardines, anchovies and mackerel are among the most common small pelagic species. Although their commercial value is low, they provide important income for the coastal population of developing countries. Small pelagics tend to form large schools which makes them an easy target for small boats and relatively simple gear, and thus makes it an essential component of food security for poor coastal populations. However, stocks of the small pelagic fish fluctuate a lot and even collapse, driven by the fishing pressure and by the natural variability at scales from seasonal to decadal. When alternative livelihoods are limited, a low catch season, year or decade, can push communities to the brink of starvation. Small pelagic fish are caught at night from long, handmade wooden boats using lamps and seine nets. The simple boats are about 10 metres in length and have typically 15 men on board with no structure for shelter. Several hundred boats set sail each night, producing a city of light in the channel and return the next morning with their catch. Catch yields and earnings for each fisher are meagre as the catch needs to be divided amongst the 15 fishers. Small pelagic fish are strongly driven by their environment. They feed on phytoplankton and zooplankton, which in these tropical waters follow complex dynamics of ocean upwelling, supplying nutrients to the surface. 
there are many complex mechanisms involved in the functioning of upwelling systems along the Tanzanian coasts. Local winds, large-scale monsoonal changes, strong boundary currents and intricate changes of the bottom topography and coastlines. Multi-decadal oscillations such as El Niño and the Indian Ocean Dipole also play a role. In the background of these complex environmental controls, the population of Tanzania is increasing and the small pelagic fish are often seen as an unlimited resource which is able to absorb this increase. However, these small pelagic fish are being overexploited, and the ecosystem dynamics of these waters are moving into a big unknown. We are beginning to see the signs of accelerating climate change. Understanding of how it may impact this complex system and the people reliant on it is a major challenge. Not much is known about physical and biogeochemical properties of these waters. Lack of local research vessels make regular monitoring nearly impossible and until recently international research expeditions were rare because of maritime security. However, the situation is beginning to change and this series of lectures will introduce you to the novel and traditional methods of oceanographic observations and analysis which are beginning to unravel a complex and intriguing dynamic of the Tanzania waters. In the next lectures, we will show why the small pelagics are so important to the coastal population of Tanzania and what role they play in their food security. We will introduce you to the key environmental factors controlling the dynamics of these fish and how we can investigate them not only in the field, but also using models and satellite observations. We will take you on board a small research vessel measuring key physical and biogeochemical parameters of the Pemba Channel. We will show how marine robotics can help us to measure the marine environment when the ship-based observations are rare. And finally, together with scientists from many disciplines working together, you will learn how interdisciplinary marine science can help address the challenges faced by our society. So um, that's one of the introductory videos from our uh, MOOC series, um, which is available freely online to anybody who wants to, to go and watch it. Um, I don't know if we said at the start, but if you have any questions as we're going through the presentations, if you'd like to put them into the, the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Um, and our next uh, presentation is from uh, Baraka Sendake which will tell you more about the, the fish and the, um, um, in the Pembo channel. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. My name is Baraka Sekadende. I'm a fisheries research officer at the Tanzania Fisheries Research Institute. And allow me now to take you through the small pelagic fishery of the Pemba Channel. And we are going to look into the perspectives, approach, and the challenges within a sustainability framework. Welcome. Now, to start with, let us see what are the small pelagic fishes. They are the fishes which are small in size. And mainly are the sardines, the anchovies, the herons, and others, which relates with those which I have just mentioned. Most of them are highly mobile, and they have short a planktonic based food chain. And some are feeding on the phytoplankton. I'm going to explain that later as a proceed. But they are also characterized by relatively short lifespan and they grow rapidly, they form large biomass and they have 
uh, habit of form forming scores and the higher variable population dynamics. Now, where do we find the small pelagic fishes? In the ocean, of course, but in the 200 meters depth in the ocean. That's why they are called epipelagic. And depending on the family, they are found both in, in the near shore and in the continental shelf environments. Now, from the photo, the first above and the last one, these are some types of small pelagic fish. But uh, in between, we can see the small pelagic in the environment. If we happen to see them in the environment, this is how they look like when you find them in the ocean. Now, why small pelagic fishery? Why do we bother to study the small pelagic? After all, they are small, they are tiny. What is the importance? Now, let's see the social point of view. We find that small projects have a special place in the food security of the coastal population, especially in East Africa. And that's because they are affordable. If you can see from the picture, there are some hips on the table and with less than a dollar, you can afford to get one hip. So they can be afforded by both poor and non poor. But also they are very low. Once you go to the market, small pelagic fishes will always be there. Not like other kinds of fish. You may go to the market planning maybe to buy a tuna fish, but once you reach there, there are no tuna in the, the market. But for small pelagic, whenever you go to the market, you will sure find a small pelagic fish, whether they are in their wet biomass or they're processed, you will find them. And they are accessible than other fish species. Now let us look at the ecological point of view of a small pelagic. We find that the small pelagic fish are the foundation of the marine ecosystem because they have a role of transferring energy from the lower to higher trophic levels, including the top predators. Now, I would like to explain this sketch. There are two dots, which you, the blue dots, which you find in the middle of this diagram. First, we have the tiny plant-like organisms, which are called phytoplankton. In the second, we have the tiny animal-like organisms, which are called zooplankton. And then we have a small pelagic fish. Now, what is being done? The phytoplankton convert energy from the sun and they use that energy and the water, they make food. This food is eaten by the zooplankton. And then the zooplankton eats the phytoplankton, those plants, those plant like organisms. And then the small plastic fish it's a zooplankton, and sometimes at certain stages of life, maybe in the larval stage, they feed directly on the phytoplankton. 
So they accumulate the energy, which was converted by the photoproton from the sun into their body. And then the small projects themselves are fed by birds, but they are also fed by human, and they're also fed by large fish. That's what we call transferring energy from the low traffic level to the high traffic level. So this is what the smoke logic can do to mediate the transferring energy from the low traffic to the high traffic, which are the birds, men, and large fishes. Okay, now let's move to the ecology, ec economic point of view. Economically, we find that small pelagic fishery is the second most important fishery in Tanzania. Although, as time goes on, and as we can see things happening in the fishery itself, one day we may find that instead of, of being the uh, second most important, it will end up on being the first most important. I can say that because I can see the trend. Those fishes which were preferred before, like leaf fishes, have now been reduced greatly. And now, this small pelagic, which was formerly known to be eaten by poor people, even those who are not poor are coming to eat small pelagic because it's available, it's more as available. But nowadays also, it's being processed and becomes palatable, not like in the previous days where it was used by poor people, but it was also used. In to, to make animal feeds. And having said so, we find that it accounts for approximately one third of the total fish catch in the Tanzania mainland. And the approximately 21% of the total catch in Zanzibar. So you can see how important is this fishery? But again, this fishery has created a lot of jobs, especially for youth and for women. Leaving away the fishers themselves who go into the fishery, meaning when to take out the fish from the water. And from the statistics which we have, we find that more than 10,000 people in Zanzibar are directly engaged either in fishery or in fishery related activities. While in the mainland Tanzania, there is a study which was conducted and found that more than 300,000 households were engaged in the fried fish business. And this fried fish are the small pelagic. So this is only the fried fish business, leaving away those who are sun drying, leaving away those who are boiling, leaving away the fishers themselves who go to fetch fish from the water. So you can see how important is this fishery. And in the case with the collapse, how many are going to lose jobs? But not only that, it also, contributes regional to regional trade with most bread fish exported to other regions in Tanzania, but even outside of the Tanzania, for example, the DRC, Democratic Republic of Congo. Now from this part of this uh, graph, I just want you to appreciate the small pelagic catch trend, its contribution to the total catch. You can see 
the total cash in the gray line and the two kinds of small pelagic which are very common, the anchovy and the sardines, in red and the blue line. So this is the trend for more than 10 years, about 12 years from 2000 to 2012. So you can see how important is this catch and how much it contributes to the total catch of the marine fishery. Now, let's come to the solstice project. The achievements which have made by the project towards the sustainability of the resource. The project has done a great and wonderful job. We have gathered a lot of information. For example, we have a lot of data from the remote sensing. But not only that, we also have in, in situ data which were collected using the advanced oceanographic technology from the source project. And we believe, and we are sure that this data will contribute to the understanding of the Tanzanian marine ecosystems, but most importantly, to the Pemba Channel, which where small pelagic fishery is taking place. And again, the project has also made a very important contribution through its peer reviewed scientific publications. We have, I think, more than 15 publications which are already out. And we believe that this information will bring new understanding of the Tanzania marine ecosystem to our policymakers. We have also prepared the policy brief, I think three of them, which will be taken to the policymakers. Not only that, the project has also built research capacity to the real marine scientists. A lot of trainings were conducted, starting from the biogeochemistry, remote sensing, and uh, even in the field, during the field mission, we have learned a lot from our fellow scientists. But with all these good stories about the small pelagic, all oh, good stories about the project, what have been done. The small pelagic fishing is still facing some challenges. I'll just mention a few, there are many, but I'll just, we have a limited research on the abundance of the small pelagic fishes. We are really exploiting but we don't know how much is in the water. We are taking out every day, but how much is remaining? This is still a game. And again, there is currently no institutional mechanism to support collaboration between the authorities that manage that shared stock of small pelagic fishes. Most importantly, climate change. Climate change is likely to impact small pelagic fish abundances, composition, behavior, and the life history of the fish. And again, information on the catch and effort abundance, distribution, and the behavior of key species is currently inadequate. 
Lastly, oh, we have a problem in fish catch statistics. The data are scarce and they are unreliable. The, the reason is we have limited resources, both financial and the human resource, because we have a large portion of the cost. We have a lot of landing sites, which makes it difficult for each landing site to have a fisheries officer to collect data. So what we report is probably less than what is actually taken out. What we record is not the reality of what is happening in the field. So this is still a challenge. Now, what should you, should we do? Or what do we think that it should be done to rescue this fisher? Then we need to find out on how can the outputs from the Solstice project be applied to support marine policy and the fisheries management. But also, we need to look on how can the outputs impact the lives of these fishes and others in the fisheries sea. Thank you. Thank you, Baraka, for that talk. Um, if anyone has any questions, if you want to type them into the Q&A box there, and I cannot read them out for you. So we have one at the moment um, for Baraka from Chris. So he says, for obvious reasons, you seem to be working exclusively on the Tanzanian side of the Ravuma River. Uh, do you still have access to information from the Parma and Pemba side of the border? Can you answer that question, Baraka, if you're there? Sorry, I didn't get your question. So the question is, for obvious reasons, do you seem to be working exclusively on the Tanzanian side of the Ravuma River? Do you still have access to information from the Palmer Pemba side of the border? Can you, can you type that so that I can read it? I still got to get it well. Sure. So Baraka, if you if, can you see the box at the bottom of the screen that says Q and A with a little Sorry. red number one next to it. If you click on that, you'll be able to see the question. I just typed it directly to you as well, if that helps. Can you see the question, Baraka? Yeah, if, if I got the question well, yes, I think we have the access for those information and data. Okay, thank you. Um, 
I had another quick question, if no one else has any for you. Um, so you say the, the information on catch data and effort data is quite um, inadequate at the moment. Um, I just wondered if you saw this improving in future. Yeah, I think we really need to improve. Although, as I mentioned, we still have that problem of resources, especially manpower resources. So if we will be in the position of maybe having more official resources, we can be in the position to have more reliable data. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, if there's no other immediate questions, should we move on to the next presentation, Amani? Yep, absolutely. Um, I think Katja was going to introduce this one. Yes, just a few words to say about communicating our research. We all know how important is such communications to um, users and stakeholders outside of academia. And Solstice produced a lot of communication material, MOOC one of the examples, and we have lots of material also relevant to our policy makers, such as policy brief and summary of the policy relevant information. But material uh, which project like ours find one of the most challenging as a material which is dedicated to explaining our research to fisheries communities. And Solstice is proud today to launch uh, such a material series of leaflets dedicated to climate change and to ocean upwelling produced especially for marine coastal communities, obviously without any access to the internet. So materials exist in forms of leaflets, which are now being sent to our partner institution and is available online. We will put uh, links into our chat, but now Amani will introduce uh, this material. Thank you. So I'll just share the screen again. Hi, I'm Amani and I'm here to talk about communicating our research. Communicating our research has been essential to all stages of the project in engaging stakeholders and local communities in capacity building and to achieve impact. Throughout the project, the Solstice team have worked to engage a broad range of audiences on local to global scales through a variety of communication platforms. Communication platforms have ranged from holding engagement events for regional and local government and fisheries managers to publications and peer reviewed journals to presenting at UN in negotiations. We have created printed information in local languages, developed a massive open online course, the MOOC, and provided information through a website and social media presence. Through these platforms, we have reached audiences from scientists to students, local decision makers and managers, and fishers in coastal communities. Communication materials such as open access research papers, information leaflets, policy briefs, and the massive and MOOC form part of the project legacy and will remain available and in use after the project has ended. Our communication efforts have cont contributed to the UN Decade of Ocean Sciences for Sustainable Development Outcome an inspiring and engaging ocean where society understands and values the ocean in relation to human well-being and sustainable development. We have recently created two new leaflets describing upwelling and climate change. These are available in English and Swahili from the Solstice website. I'll take you through these leaflets. 
The first leaf that we created is upwelling ecosystems and coastal communities. Upwelling is the movement of cold, nutrient-rich water from the deep ocean to surface waters. Upwelling supplies nutrients to surface waters, promoting the growth of plankton, which provides food for small pelagic fish. Winds drive upwelling over large areas of the East African coast during both monsoon seasons. Small-scale upwelling events can be driven by strong local currents, such as those to the west of Pemba Island. Upwelling welling drives many high-productivity fisheries that support the livelihoods of coastal communities. The position and strength of upwelling changes year to year in response to the monsoon. It is also being affected by climate change. Fisheries provide employment, economic opportunities, food security for people in coastal areas. Small pelagic fish are an important food source for coastal communities. To manage fish stocks, we need to understand how the strength and location of upwelling changes from year to year. This will help us understand future impacts of climate change and help us plan for the future. Fisher's knowledge and intuition of the marine environment can help improve management and governments of fisheries. This information could also shape future scientific studies. Report where you've noticed increased density of small fish, disturbance of the sea surface, presence of large fish, and area of colder water. The second leaflet is marine ecosystems our ocean is warming this impacts marine ecosystems in complex ways these include coral bleaching and causing fish to migrate to cooler deeper waters warmer water holds less oxygen fish migrate away from their current habitats in response to lower oxygen levels many types of fish and shellfish will struggle to survive in reduced oxygen conditions. Climate change may affect local ocean currents. Many marine animals rely on these to disperse eggs and larvae, while others rely on them for food. Changes to ocean currents may alter the distribution and dominance of fish species. Upwelling supplies nutrients from deeper water fertilizing the surface ocean. Climate change is likely to alter upwelling patterns, impacting productivity. Climate change is causing sea levels to rise. Sea level rise increases the risk of coastal flooding and wave erosion along the coast. This damages mangrove forests and seagrass meadows. Increased carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere make the ocean more acidic. This is det detrimental to the growth of coral, shellfish, and fish. When climate change impacts occur simultaneously, they can amplify each other. This may lead to greater negative impacts for the environment. Healthy and sustainably managed ecosystems and fisheries will support coastal communities into the future. Sharing knowledge of environmental change will help recognize and adapt to changing ecosystems. The development of, change, of climate change adaptation plans requires local knowledge and cooperation between scientists, communities, and managers and politicians. These leaflets and um, other communication outputs from SOLSTIS are available on our website. Thanks for listening. So those are all our communication leaflets, which we just received the printed versions of last week, and those will be sent out to um, our partners in Tanzania and Kenya for distribution soon. So I don't know if anyone had any questions about those. 
up with no pretty straightforward and I'll just drop the um a link to the output materials into the chat. You should be able to see that now. So I think we're going to go into a short five minute break now, everyone to top up their drinks. Um, and then we will be back with a presentation from Fatma Jebri in five minutes. Unless you want to follow, so we have a we had do have a, a continuation of the question that we had earlier from Baraka. If we want to to go back to that before we go to the break, um, it's a, it's a general question, so it's not um doesn't spe um apply spe specifically to Baraka, um. And the question is whether the um, current conflict in Cabo de Gado is affecting access to, to any data and does it hampered our work at all? So I don't know who on the panel might want to take that question. Where the question? Whether um, the current conflict in Cabo Delgado is affecting um, access to data and hampering our research. I'm sorry, today I can't hear very well. I will send it directly to you, Baraka. Sorry. Uh... Amani, there is a hand raised by Julius Francis, who probably can comment something if you can uh, make him a presenter or whatever we need to click there. Yeah, I can allow Julius to speak. So on you go, Julius, if you'd like to answer that question. But Julius is muted right now. Yeah. Uh, good afternoon. Uh... I think there is, there is a confusion. Uh, whoever asked the question is think, referring to Pemba of Mozambique, not Pemba of Tanzania. Uh, there is Pemba, uh, which is an island, one of the island in Zanzibar, and there is Pemba in northern Mozambique. Uh, so he's asking whether the conflict in uh, northern Mozambique did affect the research. Sources didn't work in the northern part of Mozambique. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that, Julius. Um, yes, I think you're right. There's some confusion there. I wondered if, if it meant that the, you know, the problems of the conflict spilled over um, into the Tanzanian waters. But yeah, but that makes more sense. <laughs> it's a different location. Okay, so if there are no more questions, then I think we will go for the break. So we'll be back in, in five minutes with our next video.
And I'll play the next video, which is um, about the interannual monsoon variability um, as a key driver of East African pelagic fish fisheries. Um, and that's by Fatma Jebri. Um, and then we'll have another video by Helen Kazenga. And we'll follow that with some questions. So hopefully you can all see my screen now. Hi, I'm Dr. Fatma Jebri from the National Oceanography Center, and I'll be talking about our findings on the key environmental drivers of East African small pelagics. In coastal East Africa, millions of people are dependent on small pelagics for food security and economic stability, but it remained unclear what environmental factors control the small pelagic variability. More specifically, we sought to examine the role of the monsoon since it's known to affect the Western Indian Ocean dynamics as illustrated on this schematic. The surface circulation changes with the monsoonal winds. During the Northeast monsoon, the East African coastal current flows northward to meet the southward Somali current at about three to four degree north. During the Southeast monsoon, the current strengthens with the stronger southeast winds and both the East African coastal current and the Somali current flows northward along the East African coast. We started our investigation by looking at the relationship between the chlorophyll A, which is a proxy for phytoplankton biomass and the base of the marine food chain, to the catches of herring, shads and anchovies, a group of small pelagics. As you can see on this chart, from 1998 to 2014, annual increases and declines in phytoplankton biomass are strongly associated with high and low fisheries yield. Two extremes are revealed, 2002 and 2011, as years of extreme peaks and drops in both chlorophyll A and catches, respectively. Although the chlorophyll A climatological annual mean shows oligotrophic waters over coastal East Africa, the seasonal cycle shows two annual maxima associated with two peaks of monsoonal winds with higher chlorophyll A during the southeast monsoon than, north than the northeast monsoon. This finding is also confirmed at the interannual scale as the southeast monsoon chlorophyll A maxima drawn here in red are most of the time greater than the northeast monsoon chlorophyll A maxima plotted here in blue. This enhanced phytoplankton biomass during the southeast monsoon is found driven by two current induced mechanisms coastal dynamic uplift upwelling and westward advection of nutrients, as illustrated on these figures here for 2002, a year with extreme peak in chlorophyll A. By comparing the chlorophyll A in current speed anomalies variation over the paths of the Northeast Madagascar current and the East African coastal current, it's clear that enter annually an extreme increase or decrease in chlorophyll A concentration is induced by strengthened or weakened surface currents. As pointed earlier, 2002, and 2011 appear also as extremes in terms of current speed. These changes in the strength of surface current were found dependent on the large-scale changes in the wind field for years and affected by El Nino La Nina events. As you can see on this chart, the wind stress curl intensifies along the paths of the, of the South Equatorial current, the Northeast Madagascar current in the East African coastal current prior and during the onset of the southeast monsoon with extreme peak in chlorophyll A. So here we have the example of 2002. And vice versa for southeast monsoons with extreme decrease in chlorophyll A, like we have in the bottom row here, the example of 2011. This brings me to the end of my presentation. So to conclude, 
the southeast monsoon wind strength over the south tropical Indian Ocean is found to be the main driver of year-to-year -year variability for years where the effects of El Niño La Niña are weak. The interannual changes in the monsoon can dominate the biological response along the East African coast and emerge as the main climate variability mode. Such changes can have important implications on the regional economy as it's highly dependent on fisheries. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. Hello everyone, my name is Helen Kizenga and on behalf of my fellow co-authors, I'll be discussing our work titled The Variability of Microwave Fish Cache and the Remotely Sensed Biophysical Controls in the Eastern Pema Channel. The Eastern Pemba Channel is an area between the western coast of Pemba Island and the Pemba Channel itself. This region is highly productive with health bringing reefs and small islets that provide good breeding sites for different fish. This region is highly influenced by the monsoons where we have two distinct monsoon seasons. We have the northeast monsoon season that ranges between December, January and February. And then we have the southeast monsoon season that ranges between uh, May to September. These two seasons have quite distinct uh, environmental conditions where during the northeast monsoon season we have the warmest water temperature that, uh, no, that is normally above 28 degrees centigrade and during the southeast monsoon season this is when we have the coldest water that is normally below 26.5 degrees centigrade and it has been shown that um, during the northeast monsoon season when we have the warmest temperatures we also have the lowest chlorophyll A concentrations and during the southeast monsoon season when we have the uh, coldest um, temperature this is when we, we record the high chlorophyll A concentration. Fishery is one of the important socio-economic activities in Pemba Island. This uh, employs a lot of people in Pemba and either directly or indirectly and the fishing is uh, mainly artisanal meaning that local fishers use traditional fishing vessels and gears. Small pelagic fishery is one of the important fishery in this island and uh, there are three important groups that are fished in abundance that we have the mackerel, we have anchovies and the sardines. Our study focuses on the mackerel and we focus on identifying the links between the mackerel catches and the bar fiscal controls that could be influencing their distribution around this region. Moving on to the results, uh, here we have the seasonal cycle of chlorophyll A in green line and mackerel catch in uh, a blue line. And here we can see that they have kind of a similar trend where we have the highest catches during the southeast monsoon season, which is also uh, a season where we have high chlorophyll A concentration. And then we have the lowest uh, chlorophyll A values during the northeast monsoon season, which is also uh, recorded the lowest uh, catches of mackerel. And then statistically, it was shown that chlorophyll A and mackerel are statistically positively related at one month lag, meaning that a chlorophyll A peaks one month and then a month later the mackerel catch a um, peak. And then the uh, sea surface temperature and red line is quite different from the uh, above plots where we have an opposite correlation. We have, uh, especially you can see during the northeast monsoon season here, we have uh, high the warmer temperatures and then the lowest catches are recorded. And also statistically it was shown that uh, sea surface temperature and mackerel catches were significantly negatively related also at one month lag. And then uh, two biophysical uh, parameters, the sea surface temperature in red and chlorophyll A in green were also correlated and here we can see a typical um, relationship that has been observed all over the world where we have an opposite relationship between sea surface temperature and chlorophyll A except for a little peak during the northeast monsoon season. And it was revealed that chlorophyll A and sea surface temperature are actually uh, strongly negatively related. And we also looked into um, 
uh, uh, chlorophyll A and mixed lab depth to see if there is any connection between these two and if uh, mixing could be one of the important causes of uh, abundance of phytoplankton in this region. And as we can see here, we see a very similar trend between um, chlorophyll A and the um, mixed layer depth. Uh, during the, the southeast monsoon season, this is when we have the high peak of chlorophyll A and coincidentally it is also uh, when we have the high mixing. And during the, south, the northeast monsoon here, this is when we have the lowest chlorophyll A which is also accompanied by uh, low mixing uh, activity. And then statistically it was also proven that uh, um, mixed layer depth and chlorophyll A are actually positively correlated. This could mean that the abundance of chlorophyll A or phytoplankton in these areas could be influenced by the mixing and other uh, environmental um, parameters. And then moving into the interannual variations, here we see the monthly distribution of chlorophyll A in green again and mackerel catches in blue and we can clearly now see how these uh, two parameters or two variables are actually correlated. Here uh, we can see during the second half of 2017 and the second half of 2018 where we have the highest uh, mackerel catches and this is when the chlorophyll A is recorded at highest. And then during 2015, this is the, um, the time when chlorophyll A was at the lowest and this is also when uh, the mackerel catches were observed to be uh, very low. And then st statistically, it was also again proved that uh, chlorophyll A and uh, mackerel even in the monthly cycles, they are correlated, they are significantly uh, positively correlated. And then again, looking at sea surface temperature and chlorophyll A, we again see this, the same uh, thing as we observed in the season cycles, where we see an opposite uh, relationship. As we can see here, for instance, during uh, the second half of 2017, where we have the highest catches, this is also a, a, a one of the lowest point of sea surface temperature. And then during the 2015, where uh, mackerel catches were at the lowest, then the one of the peak of sea surface temperature was also recorded. Again, the relationship was retained, which was uh, significantly negative. And then these relationships are also related, uh, retained and uh, looking at the annual means where we have here chlorophyll A and mackerel catches that have kind of a similar trend and then the mackerel catch and sea surface temperature have an opposite relationship as we can see here. And then looking at the anomalies between chlorophyll A and um, mixed layer depth, again we can see how these um, trends are kind of similar, especially when we look at during 2013 when we have one of the peak of chlorophyll A, this is when uh, mixed layer depth was at, at, at highest. And then during the, so, uh, during the 2015 when we have the lowest chlorophyll A, uh, chlorophyll A anomaly, also the lowest uh, mixed layer depth anomaly was observed and also the relationship again was uh, found to be significantly positive. To conclude, cooler sea surface temperature and high chlorophyll A was observed during the southeast monsoon season, which was also accompanied with mackerel peaks. And then the mackerel variability was coherent with chlorophyll A and sea surface temperature trends. And this was shown by strong positive correlation between chlorophyll A and the mackerel, and then a strong negative relationship between mackerel and sea surface temperature. And through looking at the mixed layer depth and chlorophyll A relationship, we can conclude that upper mixing might be one of the drivers that influence phytoplankton blooms, especially during the southeast monsoon season. 
And then the negative relationship between the mercury and sea surface temperature, which was shown that during the warmer periods, the mercury catches were very low, could indicate that the increasing temperatures as shown in climate change could actually impact these fish negatively, which can cause them to migrate to other areas. And understanding the relationship between the mackerel catches and the biophysical drivers could be crucial in identifying areas and seasons with high productivity and this could be used in management measures such as introducing spatial and seasonal closures. Thank you for listening. Thank you to Fatma and Helen for those lovely presentations. Um, I wondered if anyone had any questions from our attendees, if you want to uh, type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of the screen there. Um, and if any of our panellists have any comments or questions, please do. Um, but maybe I'll start with a question to Helen, if she's around. Um, that was a really nice presentation showing the importance of um, environmental parameters on a small pelagic fishery. Um, I just wondered if you had any other data of other small pelagics like anchovies or sardines um, to see if the same kind of patterns um, were seen um, or, if, or if you haven't looked, if there's potential to do something like that. Thank you, sir, for your question. Uh, we actually had uh, some data on the anchovies and the sardines, and that is um, that was um, another paper that I'm still currently working on. But the relationships is I'm seeing um, some might be like similar to what we observed we observed with the mackerel, but some might be different. But I think by next year it will be out so we'll see it thanks i look forward to uh, to having a look at that thank you uh, any other questions from anyone no I had one for Fatma as well, if no one else wants to jump in. <laughs> um, so you were showing Fatma that um, outside of a strong El Nino or Indian Ocean Dipole year, the winds were the main driver of uh, productivity in that region. Um, I just wondered if there was a potential for any future kind of predictability. How long would we need to know if um, we're going to have a high or low productive year, for example? Mm, you mean dependent on like how... how... Well, we know depending on the monsoon conditions. Um, this was actually not investigated uh, yet, but it's definitely um, a good um, research question. To be honest, I do not have like an answer now, but yeah. Something to look into in future maybe. Absolutely, especially that will we will have to relate like both the atmospheric and ocean forcing. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, if there's no other questions, no, then maybe we can move on to the next presentation. Okay, so next we have um, three more short presentations about the research and then we will be back for, for more questions at the end. Hi, I'm Sarah Taylor from the National Oceanography Centre, and I will be discussing our findings from looking into longer term adaptation strategies for small scale fishes in Tanzania. Fishes' ability to manage and adapt to risks of climate change depends on individual circumstances, which includes both financial and physical access to different fisheries. Studies that have been conducted on tropical fisheries in developed regions have suggested both livelihood and species diversification as a fisheries management response to try help build resilience of coastal communities. So what this involves is promoting fishers to hold jobs in different industries outside of fishing, as well as target multiple species while fishing to minimize risk. We conducted a survey in these four coastal communities in Tanzania to help assess economic dependency on fisheries, assess fish and portfolio strategies, as well as the different levels of adaptive capacity. 
The survey results found that fishers' households con consume fish approximately six times a week, which is mainly supplied by their own catch. So this proves the importance of fish for food security in all four regions. The majority of fishers already hold jobs outside of fishing, including farming, livestock, and small business activities. However, we found that not all fishers are actually able to target multiple fishers fisheries rather, and species, because multiple gear types and larger boats are not affordable for all fishers. We looked at how many species individual fishers target and for what specific purpose. So for example, a fisher could target large pelagics for commercial purposes to sell as it could have a high market value, but target small pelagics for subsistence purposes to eat at home as the market value may be lower than the large pelagic. These findings illustrate the predominant dependence on large and small pelagics in Tanga, large pelagics and reef species in Pemba, large pelagics in Zanzibar, and predominantly reef species in Mafia. We then created an acid wealth index as a measurement of wealth for each individual fisher, as well as an adaptive capacity score, which reflects how easily the fisher felt they could shift into a different job outside of fishing. Our study found that in Pemba, Zanzibar, and Mafia, the wealthiest fishers are able to target more species and have high, higher levels of adaptive capacity. So wealthy fishers are in a better position to economically access multiple gear types and then multiple species. However, less wealthy fishers have less diverse portfolios and unequal access to gear types and species. In Tanga, interestingly, fishers had in the highest acid wealth quartile target fewer species and had lower levels of adaptive capacity. We found the main risks threatening artisanal fishers' livelihoods are reduced fish abundance and underdeveloped markets and coastal communities, which limit fishery industry growth. So blue economy policy could facilitate investment in value addition programs and improvement of fishery market links to help increase opportunity to sell higher value added products. So this could involve improving information access on current competitive prices, uplifting infrastructure to keep fresh fish longer, secondary industry to produce marine products such as fish oil, as well as upskilling fishers on how to meet quality standards set by buyers. Species and gear diversification is not equally accessible to all fishers of all wealth levels in Tanzania. The suggested fisheries management response to increase adaptive capacity through livelihood and species diversification would therefore need to be supported by enabling equal access to multiple gear types, skill upliftment, and job creation. Skill upliftment and educational services, as well as workshops, could be targeted towards industries fishers are willing to move into, which is shown here. Um, in our study, we found that fishers in Tanga are mostly willing to move into small businesses and livestock management, aquaculture in Zanzibar and Pemba, and tourism in Mafia. This could help facilitate an increase in economic gains outside of fisheries as an adaptive capacity strategy. Thank you for your time. Well, I'm just stopping the video for a moment because everyone's saying it's, it's gone fuzzy. I don't know why that is. Um, hopefully the next video um, from Stuart Painter will, will work okay. So I'll just share that one now and hopefully it will, it will, the sound will be okay. Hello, my name is Stuart Painter. I'm one of the scientists at the UK's National Oceanography Centre. I'm going to give you a, a very brief overview and introduction to the results from a cruise that we conducted in the Pemba Channel as part of this programme. To provide some background or context for this survey, I'll simply say that the East African region has a reputation for being data sparse, which presents real challenges to the management of the marine environment. To illustrate this, the map on the right there is my attempt to summarize existing data for this region. So I've pulled together observations from the World Ocean Database, which is shown by the red dots there, that covers almost a century in uh, time. Uh, we have observations from WOS, there's the South African ASEP program, and there's also, if you look very closely, numerous observations which can be drawn from the literature. Now, these tend to be very much based around the coast. They're either based around the mainland, Tanzania, Kenya, or around Zanzibar and uh, Pemba. But overall, there isn't a huge amount of data, and what is there 
tends to be very unevenly distributed in time. So new information is required to support existing management plans to help develop new management plans. So the cruise itself, um, now we focused on Pemba Channel, which is a deep water channel about 800 meters deep, and uh, it supports a number of important fisheries. The environmental data from the channel, however, is very limited and in some cases perhaps a little dated. Now, you may ask yourself, why are we focusing on the Pemba Channel rather than the Zanzibar Channel to the south, which is far shallower? Well, the depth of the Pemba Channel allows intermediate depth waters to reach very close to the coast. Any upwelling of that water therefore has greater potential to enhance uh, marine productivity and thereafter support fisheries. So to, to get to the, to the bottom of what was going on in this, we, we undertook a short 10-day survey to map the distribution of nutrients, biological parameters and hydrography. And due to limitations on the ship's winch, we were limited to, to only sort of 500 metres. However, we were able to conduct over 40 stations from which we have observations of phytoplankton, zooplankton, various biogeochemical parameters and obviously the hydrography. As time is short, I'm just going to give a very quick introduction to uh, some of the results. And I think it's important to stress at the outset that the channel itself, that is the central waters over the deepest part of the channel, do display seasonality. The two images in the bottom left of your screen there show you um, the mean annual cycle in sea surface temperature and mean annual cycle in surface chlorophyll. The mean annual cycle in sea surface temperature is well reported in the literature and um, you tend to find warmer temperatures during the northern monsoon, so that tends to peak in April, cooler temperatures in the southern monsoon um, with minima hits in August and perhaps the early part of September. Coincident with this, however, and something that I haven't really found well described in the literature is the variation in surface chlorophyll. So chlorophyll concentrations tend to be below the annual average during the northern uh, monsoon, so that's the first half of the year, and they tend to be above annual average during the second half of the year. Um, for reference, the grey bar that you can see in the middle there is the time period of the cruise. If we turn our attention now to the figure in the middle, this is just an illustration of the vertical structure that we can see in the top 200 metres or so of the water column from the CTD data. Um, what this shows is that there's a very deep isothermal layer of about 100 metres uh, depth, which you can see from the blue line. Um, there's very often a deep chlorophyll maximum present on the majority, of these, uh, the majority of these stations. However, the depth of that feature was highly variable. And the contour plot on the right shows you the depth of the deep chlorophyll maximum. What that shows is that um, this feature tends to be deeper on the eastern half of the channel than on the western half of the channel. The, uh, the nutrient data show that this is a low nutrient environment. Nitrate and phosphate concentrations were about 0.1 micromolar throughout the top 100 metres at virtually every station we sampled. Um, silicate concentrations were somewhat higher, about 2.3 micromoles. These sort of average concentrations are contrary to what you can glean from some of the literature, um, which I think says something about the spatial variability or perhaps the sampling locations that people have worked from previously. In terms of the phytoplankton community resident in the uh, Pemba Channel, we found that this is very much a picoplankton dominated environment. At least 80% of the bulk chlorophyll is found in the less than two micron size fraction. A further 14% is found in the nanoplankton size fraction. So that's cells between two and 20 microns in size. And only 6% of the bulk chlorophyll can be uh, found in the microplankton size fraction. So that's everything greater than 20 microns. Now this may or may not be a surprise depending upon your uh, interests and background, but it, it's, it's worth pointing out that this should provide some guidance for future phytoplankton studies because as far as I can tell, a large proportion of existing studies focus on the microplankton. And I guess that's due to the ease with which these cells can be captured by net and seen through light microscopes. One of the more interesting attributes to this data set is that we've identified a localized upwelling cell off the west coast of Pemba. Uh, the images to your right 
show um, the contoured information at a depth of five meters. If you look at the top left, which shows the temperature plot, you can see two things. Firstly, the warmer colors being invected into the center of the channel. Well, these represent waters coming from the Zanzibar Channel and from the continental shelf along mainland Tanzania. If you look carefully, you'll see that there's a dark blue signature on the right hand side of the image. This represents the center of this upwelling feature. It's associated with uh, nutrient enhancements, as you can see from the middle row. There's a very strong nitrate signature, strong phosphate signature. There is enhancement in silicate, but it's rather muted on this scale because there's also a very large silicate signal coming out of the Zanzibar channel. If you look at the bottom row of figures, there is a muted increase in chlorophyll and a very strong increase in particular organic carbon and nitrogen associated with this upwelling um, feature. So if we put some numbers on this, what we found is that in the middle of this upwelling feature, SST is about 0.8 degrees uh, Celsius cooler than the surrounding waters. Nitrates about 0.4 micromolar higher. POC and PON are both twofold higher than anywhere else, or rather I say anywhere else, um, the average for the cruise. And um, chlorophyll is about 0.1 milligrams higher. Now, that's interesting because point one is comparable to what the satellite shows is the seasonal variability in the region. And it also represents uh, an increase of about 23% compared to the cruise average. Now in the paper, um, we, we've attempted to estimate the impact that the subwelling could have on primary production. Unfortunately, we were not able to measure that during the cruise. So we've had to uh, make a few assumptions. We've estimated that productivity may be enhanced by about 20%, which is reassuring given that the chlorophyll, the measured chlorophyll changes is equivalent to 23%. However, our estimate of the enhanced productivity resulting from this feature should be treated um, carefully as it does have high uncertainties associated with it. In terms of the implications of this data set, um, I've only touched on a few key things there, but it, it does improve um, our understanding of the spatial variability of a number of parameters within the Pemba channel. I believe the data set might be the most detailed um, available to date. And I'm pleased to say it's freely available. You just need to go to the British Oceanographic Data Centre to request access to that. Um, the key features that it shows, it, I, I guess, is this upwelling feature. Now, this is not the first time that upwelling has been found around Pemba Island. Um, the ASEP program identified island wake upwelling to the north of Pemba Island, which is just outside of the area that we were working. And like all good data sets, it raises a lot of questions. Uh, what is the real impact on productivity? Is it 20%? Is it more? Is it less? Um, maybe somebody listening will be in a position to answer that at some stage in the future. What is the mechanism at work? Um, I can't really say that from the data, so it's an open question. Why is upwelling relatively shallow? As far as we can see from the data, it's only coming from 100 meters depth. So there are questions there about the interaction between bathymetry and the current um, driving this upwelling. And crucially, is this upwelling feature permanent or seasonal? Now, from a fisheries perspective, um, I think the thing to say is that the upwelling appears to be in the same location as historic observations of high fish biomass. The image on the left of your screen there comes from the Nansen surveys conducted in the 1980s. They found a, high, a region of high fisheries biomass, which is shown in the red circle there, in roughly the same area as this upwelling feature. Interestingly, they also found a region of high fisheries biomass to the north of Pember Island, which is where the ASEP program found this island wake upwelling feature. So, are we seeing links between physics and fish? Are we actually now in a position to say that there are very strong links between upwelling mechanisms here and fish? It's an open question, but I'll leave that to the audience to discuss. Thank you. Hello, my name is Julianne Wiscott, and today I'm talking about the robotic mission 
to study the ecosystem dynamics of the Pemba Channel in Tanzania as part of the Solstice program. The Pemba Channel is a deep but narrow coastal channel that separates the island of Pemba from the East African mainland. The region's dynamics are heavily influenced by the seasonally changing monsoon. And locally, the Pemba Channel is characterized by the fast northwards flowing East Africa coastal current. This is an important area to study due to the socio-economic and food security significance that small scale pelagic fisheries play by providing livelihoods for the local coastal community. These local fisheries are maintained by primary productivity in the sunlit surface layer of the ocean. The strong temperature gradient, however, creates a barrier to the easy transfer of nutrients from the depth to the surface. The most likely physical mechanism that drive vertical nutrient transport into the sunlit surface ocean are either upwelling, where water passes with high nutrient content from a deep are lifted to the surface, represented here by the straight arrow, or vertical mixing, where due to the irreversible combination of water either side of an interface, such as the temperature gradient, properties are fluxed across this interface. And this is here represented by the circular arrows. So the aim here was to determine which of these two mechanisms is responsible to transport nutrients to the surface and subsequently drive primary productivity that maintains the fishery in the Pemba Channel. To address this question, we undertook a robotic mission in July 2019. Using a locally chartered vessel, we undertook daily missions into the Pemba Channel from our base in southern Pemba. During these daily missions, we collected vertical profiles of temperature and salinity, current speed and direction, ocean turbulence, which is how much energy is available for ocean mixing, chlorophyll A fluorescence, as well as nitrate concentrations as these are the nutrients that phytoplankton need to grow in the Pemba channel. These new observations were collected using a combination of specialist ocean robots, a turbulence profiler and an acoustic current meter. This was the first time ocean turbulence was ever measured in the Pemba channel. And all of these new measurements combined amount to over 40,000 data points in total. Let's now have a look at some of the preliminary results of our study. In the first instance, we will look at the data collected using the ocean robot as it dived down and back up to the ocean surface. You can immediately see here that there's a strong temperature gradient between the surface and the deeper waters which is something that we would expect to find in tropical waters. What is really interesting, however, is that we observe a salinity maximum that we consistently see to lie between a depth of 100 and 200 meters. The third panel shows chlorophyll A fluorescence that we use as an indicator for phytoplankton biomass. These data that show that chlorophyll efflorescence is strongest in the surface layer, as you would expect, and we see instances of elevated concentrations of chlorophyll efflorescence in the layer just below the sea surface. The bottom profile shows you all the nitrate data we collected. While, as you can see, the surface contains barely any nitrate while the concentration is higher deep down. And what we find really interesting 
is that the gradient from little to high lies across the same depth as the previously noted salinity maximum between a depth of 100 and 200 meters. So to find out what could, what could be driving this, we next have a look at the current data. In the top panel, the blue colors show the northward flowing currents and the red colors are southward flowing currents. During the entire field work, we experienced very strong northward flow at the surface, which is shown here in blue. And this is due to the East African coastal current. However, below the strong surface current, we have identified a return flow in the opposite direction, the southward direction that is shown in red here. And it is found between a depth of 100 to 200 meters. And if we now overlie these data to the salinity observations that were taken exactly the same time and space, we can see that this matches this the location of the salinity maximum we had previously noted. This suggests that this is a newly identified current that flows directly underneath the East African coastal current. This is a very important result because the two opposing currents result in a lot of energy that can be available for mixing due to the shear. In the bottom panel you can see that the red patches that show areas of high energy available for mixing, that they originate at a depth of 200 meters and they then move upward in time. So this suggests that virtual mixing is a key mechanism to transport nutrients to the surface rather than the uplift of water passes through upwelling. So to summarize our results, we have for the first time observed a new reversing current that's associated with a salinity maximum at a depth of 100 200 meters that is situated just below the East African coastal current. And we also find evidence that this drives increased mixing, which suggests that this newly identified layer has the potential to drive shear driven mixing, which in turn is responsible for the better transport of nutrients in the PEMBA channel. I stop here and thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is. Thank you for those three presentations. Um, does anyone have any questions? There's nothing in the Q&A at the moment. Wondered if any of our other uh, panelists wanted to discuss anything. If I can jump in, I have a question to Sarah, Sarah Taylor. Uh, Sarah, unfortunately for some of the participants, the sound went buzzy, I think, but for some it was apparently sounding very clearly. But um, I know that in your conclusions on um, diversification of impact, it wasn't a very clear cut. So some of the areas, I think, uh, Tanga were not following the common uh, kind of trend. Could you comment on this, please? Why do you think that might have been? And you're muted. <laughs> <laughs> I'm back. Um, so yes, we did find that in Tanga, um, they were opposite to the rest of um, the findings, and that could be that wealthier fishers were rather choosing to, to um, diversify, um, sorry, rather specialize rather than diversify, um, as they were commenting that there were weaker market links, so they would obviously rather than target specific species to ensure financial return rather than diversify and potentially not sell um, fish at the market for a specific price they were hoping for. So that was our um, understanding of the issue. Okay, thanks, Sarah. I have a comment um, which kind of like links to the discussion that Stuart has opened at the end of his presentation. Uh, I think at some point, um, Stuart was asking about seasonality of that upwelling um, on the, um, uh, was it the, uh, the east of the Pemba Channel? And I think from uh, the remote sensing um, 
analysis that we have done in the project so far, uh, that cold cell in the Eastern Pemba channel is actually seen seasonally, like every Southeast monsoon. And that was apparent specifically, I think, in Helen's paper, uh, Helen paper result. But, um, but from satellite data, of course, we can only see the surface. But to me, that kind of like indicates that the feature is seasonal. That is, yeah, I mean, there's, I think various data sets have different strengths and weaknesses and they're all showing a lot of the same features, um, but you're, you're right. I mean, it's nice to know that the remote sensing data is actually clarifying or answering that question. Um, so I, I need to revisit some things, I think. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Um, maybe if no one else has anything else, I had maybe kind of like a last question for the session um, for both Stuart and Julianne. I just wondered because these are some of the first um, observations, especially for some variables that we've seen in this region. So I just wondered if you were going to go again, what would you, what would you like to measure specifically? Um, I, I think from a sort of biogeochemical perspective, um, I'd certainly like to get some additional productivity measurements. Um, there's a few other interesting processes which have been reported from the waters around um, Zanzibar and from Pember Island as well that I'd really like to do. So rate measurements would be my sort of number one thing, I think. Yeah, and I think from, from our perspective, <clears throat> Uh, I think the, the seasonality, I think, is a very interesting aspect that we would like to look into more, so perhaps take measurements um, during the northeast monsoon as well. But we also um, uh, would like to maybe look over a full tidal cycle because we believe that the tide, uh, the site, tide being a, a deep ocean side, the tide could be very important here. So maybe looking over full um, tidal cycles so maybe spring leaps. Uh, tide a cycle and see if that has an effect on the mixing in the pan and I think that would be something we'd be interested to do in the future. Yeah, that sounds really interesting. I mean, hopefully one day. <laughs> um, Julian, what about the acoustical backscatter? What about that, that link with um, more with fish? Yes, Katya, you're making a very good point there. Uh, I haven't uh, include this in our talk here, we had intended to also use acoustical backscatter to look at the fish to make a link from the physics to the biochemistry to the fish. And we collected only a very short amount of data in this, and, but you're absolutely right to say this would be really fill, filling in the gap there and give us absolute confidence if the mechanism that we're observing is indeed um, linking all the way through the fish, not just to the prime productivity, but to uh, the higher trophic levels. And yes, that would be great if you could do that. Great, thanks, Julianne. And I think we have a question from Kennedy, mostly to Stuart, I guess. Yeah, so Kennedy's posted in the Q&A section and he says, I wonder whether the influence um, of ancient estuaries from Mount Kilimanjaro uh, considered buried beneath the sea is driving some of the nutrient signatures being observed. I'd have to think about that, to be honest with you, Kennedy. Um, it's a very interesting question, um, but I, I don't know how we would answer that at the moment. I guess in which channel? I guess in Pemba channel, if they're in Pemba channel, that would be too deep for, and given the right of flow, would be too deep to in situ influence. But if it's in um, Mafia or Zanzibar channels, which are more shallow, that might be, if there is any kind of topographic influence, that might be more pronounced, I don't know. Matthew? Um, I think just to pick up on Kennedy's point there, anything as well that could increase the sort of roughness of the topography around those deep sided areas as well uh, is likely to actually have some of its uh, further influence on that mixing field. So I think, I think that's an area because it's such a tricky parameter to measure, unfortunately, um, that would also be good to go back and have a look at. Absolutely. 
Any further comments, questions, discussion points from anyone? I can add another comment, uh, just to go back to another one earlier on, um, talking about the possibility with acoustics and backscatter. We've had quite a lot of advance lately in terms of some of the active acoustic capabilities, uh, high frequency, multi-frequency things, for instance, on surface vehicles downward looking. We've had some really nice results in UK waters that have enabled us to, by having multiple frequencies, we can actually start to pull apart different species of small pelagic and zooplankton, small pelagic fish and, and zooplankton. It'd be really nice to see if we get a future opportunity to apply that in these areas. We can only wish. Exactly. <laughs> Okay, if there's nothing else, then um, over to Katia, I think. Okay. I've, no, actually, it's to Mike. Mike is giving closing remarks today. Excellent. Oh, hi, guys. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yep, sorry, I had humongous technical problems. The first webinar I missed, and this one I managed to finally sorted out by uh, about one third of the way in. So I missed the, the, the first bit, I apologize. But um, yeah, just Katya asked me to, to mention a couple of closing remarks. The first is, uh, I see we are well within our time limit, which is amazing because so many of our meetings these days go over. Um, and um, it's also a profit for me to just thank all the speakers. I mean, I know we've all done these talks for this, uh, for, for this webinar series. It takes quite a lot of time and effort to get them done. So thank you, everybody. I think they were really, really good talks. Um, just some thoughts here is I see we've got 18 participants and I'm not sure if that's just the panelists or also the, the non-panelists, um, which is a little bit lower than, than I was anticipating. But uh, I guess that sort of just shows how hard it is to get the advertising out there. People are so busy these days. But all's not lost because this is recorded. And I assume, Amani, this is going up, or these webinars are going up onto our Solstice website. So they will be available for a while and they can be referred to by many of us um, and including ourselves to go back to just listen to some of the, the presentations and talks. Um, it's also a wonderful opportunity. I mean, I just really enjoyed sort of now being a little bit more distant from the EAC, focusing on the South African case study. It's just quite nice to go back there and have a quick recap of what we did. And it's impressive. It's, it comes through very, very impressive. I think, as Stuart was mentioning in his review of previous work and everything, there's been no other occasion. In fact, I know there's no other occasion where such a huge effort scientific efforts been put into the, the EAC region, um, particularly from the technologies of, of robotics and models and, um, and satellite technology. And I think the special issue, the EAC special issue that a uh, student in particular has, has dedicated his life recently to sorting out, um, it stands testimony to that. It's a wonderful collection. How many papers is it now? So I've got a little bit lost with one or two not making it, but I think it's 10, Stuart. No, we have 13. Is it 13? Okay. 13. Uh, I mean, that's fantastic. There's never been a special issue as far as I know. Um, in fact, there hasn't been. You'll know that as well. Uh, there's been a whole lot of WIOMSA um, uh, papers that have come out in their journal, but not a special dedicated issue like this. So yeah, I think uh, everyone can pat themselves on the back. And from my side, certainly, um, thank you very much for the huge effort you've all put into this. And Amani, uh, I know you and I have had a little bit of fighting in the background trying to get me online, but many thanks for all you, <laughs> for putting up with it. it. Looks like I'm there. Okay, uh, Katya, any comments from you? Uh, no, not really. I actually was typing and uh, trying to uh, answer Kennedy's question, not really answering it. Uh, we have another question uh, came up. Uh, no, Mike, you're absolutely right. Uh, it gets more and more difficult to com compete for attention online. Everyone's throwing conferences, meetings, everything goes online. But that's great. Uh, yeah. We're doing what we unfortunately were not uh, been able to do in person. So it's... Uh, great at least to be able to bring uh, 
some synthesis, some closure to the project, even in online form. So we have what we have, and we have two more webinars to come. And uh, next one is on South Africa, Mike, uh, your one. And one after that would be on marine technologies, uh, which we would love to see uh, all you guys also attending because it will be a lot about lessons learned from these three case studies and uh, future outlooks on studies like that. So yeah, that's, that's uh, I guess, all from me uh, as well. And hope to see you all guys next time. Thank you very much for participating. Yeah, thank you, everyone.